Well, good morning. It's good to see you all on this Lord's Day. We have a few announcements before we get started. Uh, first and foremost, the flowers today are dedicated in the glory of God and loving memory of Florence and Armin Wagner. And so we remember Eric uh, during this time. Also, uh, we extend our sympathy and offer up our prayers to Kay Coons on the passing of her husband, Don Coons, who passed away Monday the 28th. We also remember the flower on the baptismal font as we celebrate our newest member, Clara Rose Mears. We're excited for Ken and Heather and big brother Parker and big sister Maddie as they celebrate the new life within their family and in our church family as well. We're just excited uh, for a lot of things. Excited for a new year, uh, today's celebration of Epiphany, and much more to come. And so we also just want to remind everybody to, uh, to continue to wear our masks, practice social distancing, as well as uh, no singing. Uh, and also, just as a reminder, to make your reservations for next uh, week's service on the 10th. And so if you could, just go ahead and make your RSVP soon. Again, though, we are delighted that you all are here. And let us prepare our hearts for worship. For this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
Let us stand for our call to worship in the opening hymn number 150, As with Gladness, Men of Old. If you're at home and following along in your worship guide, the hymns can be found starting on page three. Arise, shine, your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your dawn. The light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Let us confess our sin to God. Join us in our corporate prayer, followed by a time of silent personal reflection. O oh God, our guide who once used a star to lead people to Christ, we confess our poor sense of direction. We let ourselves become confused, easily distracted, and lose our way. We fail to follow the signs you provide. Forgive our waywardness, O oh God. Lead us to the Christ so that we may follow his way to you. Now, O oh Lord, transform us as we continue our confession in silence. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. To all who have received him, 
To those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us now prepare our hearts for the reading of God's word with the prayer of illumination. Let us pray. God of Epiphany, we long to hear your holy word in fresh ways. Open our ears to the call of your voice. Open our eyes to the dawning of a new day. Fill us with anticipation for your future. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's Old Testament reading is Numbers 24, 15 through 19, which can be found on Old Testament, page 143 in the Pew Bibles. Please hear the word of the Lord. So he uttered his oracle, saying, The oracle of Balaam, son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is clear, the oracle of the one who hears the words of God, and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down but with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the borderlands of Moab and the territory of all the Shethites. Edom will become a possession, Seir a possession of its enemies, while Israel does valiantly. One out of Jacob shall rule and destroy the survivors of Ur. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
We now invite you, regardless of age, to a point in the service where we hold space for a lesson dedicated to our children. Please join us in a time for young disciples. Good morning and Happy New Year. I wonder how many of you have ever looked up at the sky at night and seen the stars. I also wonder, do you see lots of stars or do you see a little bit of stars? Sometimes there are lots and lots and lots of stars. And sometimes we only see just a few. It all depends on how cloudy the sky is that night and how many lights are on the ground where we are. People in cities don't see as many stars as people who live out in the country. But on a clear night, almost everyone can see the North Star. In fact, the North Star has been used by sailors to help them steer their ships in the direction that they want to go. There are people today who study stars. People have always been interested in studying the stars. They have been for thousands of years. At the time when Jesus was born, there were people living far away from Bethlehem studying the stars. One night they were looking up at the sky when they noticed something surprising, something that they had not seen before. It was a new star. How amazing! They believed that new stars did not just show up in the sky for no reason. They believed that the new star meant something important was happening in the world, so they decided to follow it. They packed for the long journey across the desert sands, and they traveled for days and weeks and months using the star to guide them. Finally, the star stopped over a house in Bethlehem. The men who had traveled for so long and so far were filled with joy. They entered the house and they found Jesus with Mary, his mother. When the men saw the, Jesus with Mary, they knew that the child was someone special someone to be honored. And so immediately they knelt down and worshiped him. Then they opened up the treasure chest that they had packed and offered Jesus precious gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Sometimes people who follow stars, these people, are called wise men. Some may think that it is because they were scientists who understood about the stars. I think that maybe they were wise because they knew when they first saw Jesus to worship him. They knelt down and immediately worshiped him. They understood that he was not an ordinary child, but someone special sent by God to lead the people like a king. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for sending the star to lead the wise men to Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world to lead all the people. Help us to be wise. Help us to be wise. And follow Jesus, wherever he leads. Amen.
Our second reading today comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. If you're following along the Pew Bible, you can turn in New Testament, page 2. Here is God's word. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observe his star at its rising, and have come to pay homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the wise men and learned from the exact time which the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that had been seen at its rising, until it stopped with the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock. And our Redeemer. Amen. Well, again, I can say to you all, Happy New Year. I know for many of us, we're looking at this new year as probably unlike ever before. It seems like yesterday, I loaded up our very vans in our church parking lot, and I I took our college students to Atlanta where we go to Passion almost every single year, with the exception of this year. We loaded up, and we headed for the Georgia Dome. And and last year, they decided that we're going to bring in the new year in the Georgia Dome. So we're actually going to do the whole countdown in the Georgia Dome with 60,000 college students. It was incredible. Louis Giglio, uh, if you all might might know him, he's a pastor in uh, Atlanta Passion City Church. He has been doing this sort of gathering now for 24 years, and it's just grown exponentially over the years. And Louis, as he was leading the countdown, and as the ball was dropping, he did a little play on words. Some of you all might know from history, the last 20s that we had, they were referred to as the Roaring Twenties. And as the clock ticked down from three, two, one, zero, Louis said, Let us roar into the new 20s that are before us. Yeah, we roared all right. We we roared. I'm not so sure that roar was exactly what we had anticipated or what we had hoped for. But I still believe this more than anything. God is still on the throne, and he is still working. Regardless of what our hopes and expectations were last year and even as we stand here looking into the new year. Well, we look at the new year, and it's this Sunday that we get to celebrate, not only the new year, but we get to celebrate Epiphany Sunday. Now, y'all have to understand for my own growth, and I admit to you all, I, I have used the word epiphany over the years. I've used it correctly. It has many, um, Many moments in context, it it means sudden revelation and insight. And that's how I've probably used it in most of my vocabulary when using the word. I'll give you an example. 
I have had several epiphanies throughout my life, one in particular of which I can remember as if it was yesterday. I had this epiphany late middle school, early, early high school. Or the context of this is I have subscribed to the idea up to this point and stand on it, boots in the sand, heels digging in, that squash is terrible. It's awful. You could not convince me otherwise. If somebody were to ask me, hey, is this the hill you're going to die on? I might not say yes, but I will give it serious thought. And most of my bringing, upbringing uh, to exposure to squash came from our cafeteria in elementary school. Bless our, our lunch ladies as they would just scoop and keep moving, scoop and keep moving. And, and there, at least every other week, we would get a portion of this yellow, goopy, watery squash as it would hit our plate. And I subscribe to the idea there's just no way in the world that I will ever like something like this. Now, fast forward several years, I'm in middle school, early high school, and I'm going up to, to see my family in Tennessee. There, uh, I'm at the, at the table uh, with my cousins. My cousin Ursula, she asked me when we had first arrived, she said, hey, is there anything you don't like so that I know not to prepare it? And without missing a beat, I said, beets and squash, do not Make beets or squash. Will not taste it. Will not touch it. Ten-foot pole. I said, okay. Probably know where this is going. So we're sitting there at the, uh, the dinner table. And you got to understand, it, it, it's, it's a southern spread like no other. And so just dishes and platters and everything are just being passed around. We came to this substance, which I looked at, and it looked rather strange. And I, I said, Ursula, what's this? She said, eat up, and I'll tell you. Right there, I should have known. But it was fried, so it had to taste good, right? Spoon some up, take a bite. She said, do you like it? I said, yeah, it's good. She said, you know what you're eating? She got that twinkle in her eye. She said, you're eating squash. I said, I can't. I can't eat squash. This tastes good. Squash tastes bad. Therefore, this is not squash. She said, well, you are. I said, oh. I've had an epiphany. Squash tastes good. My whole world and life change had been revolved around this moment here in time. I suddenly opened up my eyes and senses to squash casserole, grilled squash, and I even dare say, I even went back even later on to try some of just that steamed squash. And you know what? It wasn't as bad as I remember. I had an epiphany. Squash tastes good. Well, I used this word in its correct uh, form, I will say this. The heart behind epiphany runs a lot deeper, doesn't it? Epiphany is a time where we specifically celebrate the good news and coming to the Gentiles. So much that I love what Webster and Oxford Dictionary, it's the first definition out of the gate in bold, making no mistake about it. Epiphany, according to Webster, are these words. January 6th, observed as a Christian festival in the commemoration of the coming of the Magi as the first manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. Let me just say that last line again. The first manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. This moment and the life of us as Christian is a banner moment for sure. For so long, I just saw the wise men as just a group of men just more or less kind of passing through. And, and hearing of this star and this king, they just decided to bring some gifts and kind of keep going. But I never really understood as a young boy really what this moment really meant for the entire global church. This idea, though, it, it brings more questions to my mind. Questions like, who are the Magi? And why were they so important? Truthfully, very little is known about the Magi. The only recording in which we have comes from Matthew, the very text of which we just read. 
And that's about it. What we do know is this. The word magi comes from the Greek word magos. It means magician. We know that there was more than one. They came from the east. They followed a star that brought them to Jesus. They brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They paid homage to Jesus, and being warned in a dream, they returned another way to go home because of Herod's intent to destroy the child. What we likely know from history and commentators, commentators like Michael Wilkins, is that he says they were Babylonians and Persians. Wilkins goes on to say, Magi were usually leading figures in the religious court of life of their country and origin, employing a variety of astrology, wisdom, and magical incantations to their work. End quote. However, for me, this brings more questions to mind. Is there any significance to the gifts? What exactly did the star look like? There's many theories as to what that brought. What made it so special? And these, while they might be great questions to explore perhaps another time, I want us to focus on the idea, though, that the Magi were Gentiles. And this is truly a moment of celebration, for it is truly a gift that keeps on giving. God stops at nothing to declare his love, not for just one people group, but for the whole world. We see this time and time again as God takes the most unlikely sources. And he doesn't bring glory to that particular moment, to that particular name, but he uses those moments to bring glory to his name. We saw this time and time again within our summer series, the What Did I Miss series. There's no way. There's no way a young boy, David, should have beat a man of war by the name of Goliath. There's no way in the world that Samson should have beaten an entire Philistine army with a donkey jawbone. There's no way that shepherds would be the first ones to declare the good news to all people. There's no way that a group of magi Magicians, astrologers, Gentiles would be allowed in what we know as the Christmas story unless, unless God himself is at hand. Understand, and we've looked at rivalry within the past. Recently we looked at at how Peter and Cornelius came together, both Jew and Gentile, and they broke bread, they broke social barriers, sitting down together, showing the world that it is no longer Jew and Gentile separate, but that we can come together under one name. Here, here we have an unlikely story, though, that would have caused first century Jewish believers to do a major double take. One of those moments where they would have said, did I read that right? Magi, allowed into the home of a devout Jewish family? Babylonians? Persians? Magicians? Astrologers? Into a Jewish home? Any well-studied Hebrew would have known that that sort of people group we are to have nothing to do with. Leviticus 18. They would have been reminded of these words. When you come into the land of the Lord your God who is giving to you, you should not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall be found among you 
No one who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. No one who, who offers the practices of divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or sorcery or charmers of medians or necromancers or anyone who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. Because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. The list here that Moses gives is a warning to all that you should not seek guidance from magicians or sorcerers or omens or things of this nature. You should not call upon manifestation that does not come from God himself. The question is why? The heart behind it is this. Because you're putting yourself on the throne. You're seeking an interpretation or an omen or a fortune that says, I want to know my own future. I want to know what is to happen so I can bring about prediction. There's one reason why God calls it an abomination. He simply put, Israel, stay away from such practices and people. So how then, how then does God allow for these men of the East as part of our Christmas and Advent story? I'll tell you. Because God can take anything and use it for his glory. God can take anything and use it for his redemption. For these magi, and for people all over the world of past and present and future. We remember Babylon. Babylon conquered Israel hundreds of years before, before they showed up to see the young boy, Jesus. When we think about the historical influence that these magi or Babylonians would have been exposed to upon capture, they would have been taught by, by rabbis, by teachers of the law. It was Babylon's way of understanding and knowing culture as well as its enemy. They wanted to know everything about them. Kind of reminds me of Abraham Lincoln's words. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Babylon would have understood and went to a great degree to understand who they just captured. And in doing so, they would have understood the law. They would have known about the stars. They would have known what Jenny read earlier. I'll read it again. Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. The prophet says this, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Regardless of their motivations in the beginning, these magi would have been stirred enough they would have been stirred enough to make a 900-mile journey from Persia all the way to Bethlehem on foot, on camel. Understand, nobody makes that kind of journey just on a whim. Nobody just says, eh, I got nothing else to do. I guess I'll just go ahead and walk 900 miles. Unless... There was reason to get up and go. For the prophecy was worthy to behold because it says a scepter refers to as a king. They were motivated enough to see this king to which the scripture talked about. It brings true what David said in Psalm 8. I look up to the heavens, and the stars declare your glory.
It's not that the stars themselves have power, but it is the one who gives power. The stars declare your glory, O Lord. And again, while little is known about the Magi, and maybe what conversations took place, one thing is for sure. When they got to Bethlehem, Scripture says these words. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In moments like this, we can see that their hearts and their minds and their souls were brought to a greater understanding. For while they might have set out with the idea of seeing the stars as something as power, their mindset was changed when they entered the house. For they fell down and they worshiped Jesus. They worshiped him. Understand just how big for a moment this Christmas story is. God takes a group of shepherds. and Using angels, he declares, I bring you good news for all the people. And we see this put to test. When you say all, do you really mean all? True. Because that good news is extended to not only shepherds, but to a group of magi, astrologers, magicians, Gentiles. The entire world is invited to lay down our own throne and to fall just like the shepherds, just like the magi to kneel down and to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. If this doesn't paint a picture of God's love for humanity, I don't know what does. There's only one word that could be used to describe such a moment. An epiphany has been given to the world. My challenge to myself and to us as a congregation is simply this. As we head into the new year, what links will we go to to seek and to pursue and to find Jesus in new and fresh ways? And more importantly, to worship him as the true King of Kings and Lord of Lords. To God alone be the glory. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we come before you. We pay homage to your name. We worship your name. We pray, Lord, that we would find you in new ways. That you would also meet us where we need to be met. There are so many who are looking into this year with hope. And there are so many that are still suffering the effects of 2020. Father, in all of this, meet us. Meet our congregation. Meet our world where we need to be met so that we might worship you, declaring you as king. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Now we continue with the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, again, Happy New Year. My hope and my charge to us as well as myself is this. My hope for us as a church congregation that we can look to the hope of this new year but keeping Jesus Christ at the center. To follow him and to pursue him in new ways like never before. But to more importantly, continue to worship him. Again, putting him at the center of our lives. That's my hope for here and us, here and now, as we look into the new year. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine all upon your face. And the rain fall soft upon your field. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hands this day and forevermore. Amen. Join us at First Presbyterian Church Sundays at 11 a.m. in our sanctuary or live streamed on our website or watch.